to Broadway Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Cheryl, and you have joined us on week eight of our Life Hack Sermon Series, Practical Solutions to Everyday Problems. In just a few moments, Pastor Lewis will be sharing a great message with us. But before we continue, I would love for you to share this video, as it really does help spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, we encourage you to do this now, and you'll always be in the loop with all of the content here at Broadway. In just a few moments, the worship team is going to come and lead us in a time of worship. But before this happens, let's watch these videos together. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Megan and I am the Vancouver Campus Kids Pastor. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? Women from all campuses and of all ages are invited to join us for a morning of worship, teaching, testimonies, prayer, and of course, community building. The event is called Coffee Date Unplugged and is happening on May 13th from 9.30 to noon at the Vancouver campus. The cost is $5 and you can register under the Women's Ministry tab on the website. The Spanish ministry is changing their monthly meeting dates. If you're a Spanish speaker, you are now invited to join our Spanish ministry on the first and third Sundays of the month at 12.30 p.m. in the lower auditorium at the Vancouver campus. For more information, check out our website. This summer, we have a week-long kids camp for kids aged four to grade four. It's happening on July 17th to the 21st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The cost is $60 and you can register under the kids and family section of our website. This is a camp that is open to all the kids at all of our campuses. As well as this, we're also looking for volunteers. So if you're available, sign up online. As well as kids camp, we have preteen camp coming up. This camp is for grades five to eight and it's also happening from July 17th to 21st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The week will be packed with fun activities and day trips such as glow in the dark bowling, paintball, laser tag, and water wars. The cost is $100 and you can register on the preteen page of the website. All campuses are invited. If you missed anything that I said, you can visit our website, broadwaychurch.com for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Hello, Broadway family. Welcome to church. The Bible says, let's enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. So we worship Jesus today. Come on, let's put our hands together. We sing that praise. Let praise be left when that silence is the enemy. Let praise be left when that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and the chain.
like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what feeling feels like and this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you
Yes, God, nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to your love, your faithfulness. You're faithful. You never fail. You never change. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Come on church, we sing your promise
to Broadway Church. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship today. Now, if you're new to Broadway Church, we would love for you to fill out our digital in-touch card. Just scan the QR code on the screen and fill out the form. A pastor will get back to you and help to answer your questions about growing in your faith or connecting here at Broadway. We are now going to transition into our time of giving. If you are new to Broadway Church, please feel under no obligation to give. You do not have to pay to watch or attend church. However, if you would like to financially support what God is doing here at Broadway, we would love for you to do that now. Our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on our website and check out the online banking giving option. We can also accept your credit card over the phone if you call into the church office. You can also come in in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you'd like to drop it off. You can also use text to give. If you text the word give to the number on the screen, it will walk you through all of the prompts to get that set up. Or you can mail your checks into the church. We also want to help you by providing some discussion questions based on today's topic immediately after the sermon. As I mentioned earlier, Pastor Lewis will be sharing from God's Word with us in just a moment, but you still have time to share this video as it really does help us reach many more people and share the good news of Jesus. Thank you once again for tuning in with us. What does the word freedom mean to you? In the movie Braveheart, William Wallace, he's a Scottish man who has rallied his country to fight against England. And there's an epic scene in this movie where William Wallace, he's captured and being tortured and he's about to die. And there's a crowd watching all this happen. And as they're watching, one of the guards announce this. They say, the prisoner wishes to say a word. And with his last breath, William Wallace, he shouts, freedom! It was epic. For William Wallace, freedom was the liberty of Scotland from the tyranny of England. However, when my kids get home from their last day of school before summer holidays, they drop their backpacks, they kick off their shoes, and they too yell, Freedom! I mean, for my kids, freedom is the liberty of relaxing for two months from the tyranny of school. I mean, freedom means different things to different people, doesn't it? What does freedom mean to you? How would you define freedom? Think about it. I mean, is freedom simply the having the ability to do whatever you feel like doing? Or are there boundaries to freedom? Is freedom doing whatever you feel like doing as long as it's legal? So in a country where cutting someone's hand off who stole from me is legal, I can slice and dice with no guilt? I mean, is that freedom? You'd probably argue, well, well cutting someone's hand off is hurting another person. So I can't just be free to do that. I mean, that's not right, I don't think. Okay, so then is freedom the ability to do whatever you feel like doing as long as it doesn't hurt anyone? As you can see, once you begin to unpack the term freedom, you realize it means different things to different people and it can get complicated. But this is actually not a new thing. This is not something that's new to this generation or this century or even this millennia. People were asking these types of questions 2,000 years ago. In fact, it seems like these are the types of questions that Christ followers were working through 2,000 years ago in a local church. In this current series that we're in called Life Hacks, we're jumping into an ancient letter written by a man named Paul to an early church in the city of Corinth. Apparently in this church, they were having disagreements about how to use one's freedom. This congregation was taught that there is freedom in Christ, which is a biblical principle, by the way. 
but they were taking that freedom to an extreme. Apparently, some members of this first century church defined freedom as doing whatever I feel like doing. And some of these early Christ followers, they chose to do whatever they felt like doing when it came to sex. And we know a couple of examples of what was happening within this church congregation. We know that a man who was, who was part of this church in Corinth, we know that he was sleeping with his stepmom. And the rest of the church, they were, for whatever reason, accepting it. We also know that some men in the Corinth church were visiting a pagan temple prostitutes, which was actually acceptable in the Greco-Roman world, but not acceptable in the Christian world. And they wanted the rest of the church to accept it. So apparently some people within this ancient church had a very casual view of sex. They didn't see sex as a moral issue. They didn't see sex as a big deal. Some were doing whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do it, and they justified it in the name of freedom. And so, Paul writes this section of this ancient letter to address the issue of freedom and to remind this congregation what the Bible teaches regarding sex. Do you have a person in your life who has an excuse for every bad or borderline action in their life? Maybe it's a best friend who never seems to find fault in any of their actions. Maybe it's a coworker who seems to have a justification for any borderline things that they do. Or maybe you have a child who even when doing something blatantly wrong is able to somehow convince themselves and try to convince you that the, what they're doing is not that bad. Well, some members of this church in Corinth were doing some blatantly wrong things when it came to sex. And just like that person in your life, they had excuses for everything. And they justified their actions with these arguments, which were really excuses. They said, listen, we're doing what we're doing because, first of all, it's legal. They argued, what we're doing is not against the law, therefore it's not a sin. I have a right to do anything, they argued. That was their argument. It's legal. Secondly, they said that what they're doing is natural. They argued that sexual desire is just like any other human appetite. In fact, a common phrase that they used back in this, in this church, in this uh, area, was food for the stomach and stomach for the food. Meaning their mindset was, if you're hungry, then eat. <laughs> My sexual desire is natural. If I'm hungry, I'll just eat. Finally, they said, well, it's just physical. Their argument was, our physical bodies don't really matter since it's only our spirit that lives forever. They said, sex is merely physical. It's just a physical act. And therefore, it's not tied to our morality. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. So justifying their actions with those arguments, some members of this congregation were indulging in their sexual appetite to do whatever they wanted. Now, before we move on, I, I think we need to ask an important question here. I mean, do these people have a point? If something is legal, am I justified in doing it? I mean, if it's natural, am I justified in doing it? In the realm of sex, if it's merely physical, am I justifying to do whatever I want to do? I mean, what makes something morally right or morally wrong? Who decides? Well, actually, I decided to Google this exact question. I Googled, who decides what's morally right and wrong? And the answer that came up was actually very intriguing. Google said, it's not a person nor a group of people who determine what the moral law requires of you. Google said, it is you. It is your reason. Is that true? I mean, do I determine my own moral law? Who has the final say when it comes to morality? Who gets the deciding vote? Well, as far as a Christ follower is concerned, if you're a Christ follower, the answer is Jesus. 
might be thinking, well, why does Jesus get the deciding vote? Well, because Jesus resurrected from the dead. What does that have to do with anything? I mean, how does the fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, I mean, how does that make him an authority on issues of human sexuality? Well, it's because that it was his resurrection that validated his authority. See, we're followers of Jesus because of the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus was on earth, he made a lot of claims. Jesus said that he was the son of God. Jesus said that he was the Messiah, the chosen one. Jesus claimed that the only way to God was through him. It's a big claim. He made claims about who he was and what he believed. And so if Jesus died on the cross and did not rise from the grave, every one of those claims would be false. If Jesus died and was buried and somehow we were able to find his bones today, Christianity would be false. But the fact that Jesus did resurrect from the dead, it actually confirmed that he was who he said he was. And the fact that he rose from the grave confirmed everything that he taught. In fact, we've taught on the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to learn more about that, you can scan the QR code and it'll link you directly to that video and you can watch that on your own. But as his followers, as Christ followers, we now look to believe what Jesus believed and teach what he taught and live like he lived and love like he loved. And get this, Jesus believed and taught and lived that the Bible has the final authority in life. And as his followers, we do the same. And so you're about to hear the biblical worldview of what the Bible teaches about human sexuality. It isn't the answer that I came up with. It's not what our staff came up with. It's not what our denomination came up with. This is what God declares through scripture. So what does the Bible consider to be sexually immoral? Well, first, it's any sexual relationship outside of the marriage covenant. Anything outside of the marriage covenant is not permissible, according to Scripture. Secondly, any sexual relationship between members of the same sex. So God designed sex to be between one man and one woman in the confines of a marriage covenant. Third, any sexual relationship between humans and animals. And finally, any sexual relationship between certain family members, like we talked about today, that one individual sleeping with his stepmom. Those are the boundaries that God gives us regarding sexual relationships. And that is what God considers to be sexually immoral. Now, if you don't consider yourself a Christ follower, you may or may not believe what I just said. And that's your choice. You have the right to believe whatever you want to believe. However, if you do consider yourself a Christ follower, you're declaring that your moral compass is what Scripture teaches. And Scripture is quite clear on what is right and wrong when it comes to sexual immorality. So, with that worldview in mind, how does Paul respond to the arguments made by some of these church members? First, what does Paul say about the legal argument? Well, in this letter, Paul quotes members of that congregation. I have the right to do anything, you say. But Paul adds, but not everything is beneficial. Again, he quotes them. I have the right to do anything, you say. But Paul adds, but I will not be mastered by anything. You see, Paul's arguing that it's not as simple as saying, it's legal, therefore I have the right to do it. Paul adds a layer to their justification. He gives them some more guidelines to think through. He says, sure, it may be legal, but does it bless others? Is it beneficial? Sure, it may be legal, but does it control you? Are you mastered by it? It seems like Paul limits Christian liberty by the boundaries of edification, is it beneficial, and self-control, are you mastered? So this legal argument doesn't work for Paul. Okay, so then what about the natural argument? 
I mean, their justification was, if it feels natural, just do it. I mean, our bodies are just going to be destroyed anyway, so we can do whatever we want with them. Well, Paul dismantles that argument as well. You say, Paul quotes them again, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. You see, Paul corrects their wrong view again. Paul says, you argue that sex is natural so I can do whatever I want, but you're wrong. The body wasn't designed for sexual immorality. That's not how it was designed. That's not how God designed it. Paul's saying, you're using your body in in ways that are damaging to it because God didn't design your body for that purpose. So the natural argument doesn't work for Paul. So what about the final argument? What about the physical argument? Well, here Paul again corrects the wrong thinking. He says, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and get this, and he will raise us also. Meaning, he's teaching, your body will be resurrected. He's saying, you think that your physical body it doesn't matter, but it does. You think that it's only your spirit that lives on when you die, but you're wrong. God will raise up your physical body also. Your body is designed to be eternal. In fact, we're going to be talking about this in more detail later on in the series when we answer the question, what kind of bodies will Christ followers have in heaven? But Paul is saying, listen guys, you have a wrong view of the body. Your body is actually meant to be eternal. It's going to be resurrected. Paul says, you're totally off. Your justifications here regarding your sexual immorality are not only wrong-headed, but they're not even true. And so he dismantles their wrong thinking. Now, I grew up in a Christian school called Pacific Academy. And at this school, we had to wear a school uniform every single day. And not only did we need to wear a uniform, but there were so many rules that we had to follow about how the uniform was to be worn. If you wore pants, you needed to wear black socks. Not gray socks, not white socks, black socks. If not, you would get in trouble. If you wore shorts, you would need to wear white socks. Not gray socks, not black socks, white socks with shorts. If not, you guessed it, you would get in trouble. And your shirt needed to be tucked in at all times. If it wasn't, you would get in trouble. (laughs) Oh, and your undershirt needed to be white with no logos on it. If there was a logo that could be seen through the shirt, you needed to take it off the undershirt. Go to the bathroom, take it off. And your shoes, they needed to be all black. Not black with some white. Not black with gray trim. Nope. All black. If not, you guessed it, you would get in trouble. I mean, there were so many rules to follow, and growing up, we all hated it. I mean, as a child, I wondered why the school was so concerned about my clothes. Now as a parent, I mean, I can see why. I mean, do you feel the same way about all these these perceived rules that the Bible has regarding sex? I mean, why so many rules? Why is God so concerned about my sexuality? Well, believe it or not, he has good reason to be concerned about our sexuality. Why? Well, because sex is not just sex. And when sex is used outside of God's design, it's a sin of great depth. Sexual sin is of great depth. Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. See, Paul's teaching that sex deeply unites and unifies two people. Sex brings two people together like nothing else can. Paul understands the great depth 
that sex can bring to a relationship. I mean, God created sex for that purpose. And it can be such a uniting act when used in the confines of a marriage covenant between one man and one woman. But it can be such a destructive act when used outside of God's design. I mean, look what Paul says here. If you're following along in your Bibles, you can underline this. He says, when sleeping with a prostitute, you are one with her in body. You see, he's saying sexual sin attacks us at the physical level. It's it's a physical thing that's going on. He goes on, the two will become one flesh. You can underline that in your Bible. He's saying sexual sin is not only physical, but it attacks us on an emotional level. It's more than just physical. There's an emotional bond that's created. And not only is there an attack on the physical and emotional levels, but sexual sin attacks us at a spiritual level as well. Paul says, whoever is united with the Lord is one with the Lord in spirit. And so when you unite sexually with someone outside of God's design, it attacks us at a spiritual level. It affects a Christ's followers union with God. Paul saying, what you do with your body matters. It affects you to great depths. You see, God sets boundaries around sex, not because, not only because sexual sin is of great depth, but also because sexual sin is of great destruction. There's great destruction in it. Paul commands Christ followers to flee from sexual sin, to run away from it, to get far away from sexual immorality. He says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Why? Well, because sexual sin wreaks havoc on you and those around you. I mean, just think for a moment what would not, what we would not have to deal with in our world if everyone followed God's guidelines when it came to sex. There would be no sexually transmitted diseases. There would be no sexual exploitation, no sex trafficking or sexual abuse. I mean, just think of all the destruction from just that one last point. There would be no marital issues due to a cheating spouse, no marital issues due to previous sexual experiences. I mean, those are just a few of the big ones that come to mind. There's a reason God places boundaries around sex. It's actually for your own good and for the good of those around us. So flee from it is the challenge. Why does God care about our sexuality? Well, because sexual sin is of great depth, of great destruction, and it is also of great dishonor. I, I remember when I turned 16 years old, I began to drive around my parents' brown Chevy Malibu. For the first few months of driving it, I always tried to be very respectful and ask if I could use it whenever I wanted it and ask when I needed to have it home by. But after a few months, something switched in my mind. For some reason, I began to have a sense of entitlement about using their car. Suddenly, if the car was unavailable, I threw a little temper tantrum. If I couldn't stay out as late as I wanted to, I wasn't very happy. Somewhere along the way, I thought that that was my car and that I can drive it anywhere and any time that I wanted. My parents quickly reminded me that that was absolutely not the case. I mean, I needed a stern reminder by my parents that this was their car, not mine. It seems like some of these Christ followers that attended the church in Corinth needed a stern reminder about whose they are. I mean, look what Paul says. He goes on, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I mean, Paul reminds them, he says, you were not your own. You were bought at a price. If you think about it, this is the message of the gospel. If you're a Christ follower, 
you believe and have accepted that Jesus died for you. You believe that he died on the cross for your sin, for your brokenness, so that you can be forgiven. So the price that was paid for you was the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that price was paid so that you and I could have a new life in Christ, so that our future can be secured. That price was paid so that you and I can commune with God. I mean, when you follow Jesus, you accept that truth. When you follow Jesus, in fact, you're transformed by that truth. But just like me and my parents, Chevy Malibu, just like these Christ followers 2,000 years ago, you and I sometimes need a reminder about whose we are. If you're a Christ follower, you believe that you and I were bought at a price. If you're a Christ fo follower, you believe that you are not your own. And therefore, if you're a Christ follower, when it comes to sex, your attitude cannot be my body, my choice. No. You were bought at a price. You are not your own. And so when you follow Jesus, you're saying, God, all I have is yours. And that includes your body. I mean, we can't just compartmentalize this area in our lives. And therefore, Paul challenges, he goes on and challenges these Christ followers to honor God with your body. And when you do not honor God with your bodies, it defiles God's temple as God's spirit lives within you. And it defiles God's ownership as he bought you at a price. You see, sex outside of God's design, it brings dishonor to God. And that leads us to today's life hack, where we provide a practical solution to an everyday problem. When it comes to sex and the everyday temptations that are all around us, you need to remember and remind yourself that my desire must submit to God's design. My desire must submit to God's design. If you consider yourself a Christ follower, if you acknowledge that you are not your own, rather God's, if you acknowledge that Jesus did in fact die and rise again, then your desire must submit to God's design. When it comes to sex, our attitude must be, this is God's body and therefore it's God's choice. Now let's be honest with each other here. You and I have all kinds of desires when it comes to sexuality. But it's not those desires that we allow to rule over our life. It's not those desires that we follow. No, it's God's design. As a Christ follower, my desire must submit to God's design. So the question is, are you willing to submit to God's design when it comes to your sexuality? Are you willing to follow what God has outlined in his word? I mean, that's a question that only you can answer. But before we close, I want to answer one final question. Perhaps you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, okay, Lewis, this is all well and good, but I've already messed up. I mean, what do I do if I'm living outside of God's design right now? I mean, what if I've made many decisions in terms of sex that are outside of God's design, what do I do? If that's you, I want to encourage you to ask for forgiveness right now. You need to know that God is faithful to forgive. He's faithful to give second chances. So turn to God. Ask him to forgive you and begin living out his design for your life. Why don't you bow your heads with me as I pray and God, I pray for each person here today that wants to follow your design. God, I, I pray for those who acknowledge that they've messed up in the past and that they want to get on track with you, with what your design is for their life. God, give them the strength and the courage to do just that. God, I pray for those that have been hurt and scarred in their life from different things that have happened to them. God, people that have trauma in their life, from sexual immorality in our world. I pray that you bring healing into their life right now. 
God, and I pray for those people right now that want to follow you, that say, God, I want to get my whole life on track right now. I pray that you would come into their life and that you would shape them and mold them into the person that you want them to be starting right now. We just pray this in your name. Amen. If you made that decision with me today, if you prayed that prayer with me today, or maybe you have questions or have any prayer requests that, that you wanna to bring to our team, there's a number on the screen here right now. I'd encourage you to text that number. We have a pastor on the other end. We wanna answer any questions that you may have, and we wanna walk with you on this journey that you're on today. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, please text the number on the screen. Or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, please scan the QR code on the screen and a pastor will reply and help you get connected to a place where you can best serve and grow. Now here are the discussion questions you can use based on today's sermon. What does freedom mean to you? What justifications do people use to be sexually immoral? How does the world define sexual immorality? Why is God's design of sex and relationships so important for Christ followers today? Now we pray that by engaging deeper into today's message, it will help you along in your spiritual walk. Lastly, don't forget to check out broadwaychurch.com for all of the things going on at the church and have a wonderful week. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Megan and I am the Vancouver Campus Kids Pastor. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? Women from all campuses and of all ages are invited to join us for a morning of worship, teaching, testimonies, prayer, and of course, community building. The event is called Coffee Date Unplugged and is happening on May 13th from 9.30 to noon at the Vancouver campus. The cost is $5 and you can register under the Women's Ministry tab on the website. The Spanish ministry is changing their monthly meeting dates. If you're a Spanish speaker, you are now invited to join our Spanish ministry on the first and third Sundays of the month at 12.30 p.m. in the lower auditorium at the Vancouver campus. For more information, check out our website. This summer, we have a week-long kids camp for kids aged four to grade four. It's happening on July 17th to the 21st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The cost is $60 and you can register under the kids and family section of our website. This is a camp that is open to all the kids at all of our campuses. As well as this, we're also looking for volunteers. So if you're available, sign up online. As well as kids camp, we have preteen camp coming up. This camp is for grades five to eight and it's also happening from July 17th to 21st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The week will be packed with fun activities and day trips such as glow in the dark bowling, paintball, laser tag, and water wars. The cost is $100 and you can register on the preteen page of the website. All campuses are invited. If you missed anything that I said, you can visit our website, broadwaychurch.com for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.